don't forget it. All right. <clears throat> so we are reviewing for exam two today. And I handed out these sample questions the other day. Is there anything in particular you guys want to see, or y'all just want me to start at the beginning? Mm -hmm. What's Completing it? the square. Completing the square. <laughs> Let's see what we got. Okay, let's see where it is. Um, number five? That's the one you're after? Or a different one? Number five. Okay. Number five it is. Okay, number five says be able to complete the square both algebraically and geom geometrically the way Al Khwarizmi did in his book about algebra. Um, to practice, you can use this example. X squared plus 12X equals 64. And if you remember from the lectures, I did not make you do the right-hand side, right? We only focused in on the left-hand side. So <clears throat> you can do the right-hand side geometrically, but it's a little bit of a pain. So we're just not going to mess with all those tiny little squares. So x squared plus 12x. If you've done any kind of algebra block stuff now, ooh, you should know that an x squared is <laughs> this guy, right? Okay, he's an x by x. And whenever we look at the 12x, the idea was if I'm doing this mathematically, algebraically, so here's the geometry over here. And I'm going to do the algebra over here. So algebraically, what I do is I move the number part to this, the number without variables to one side, and I keep the variables on the other side. Well, that's already done for me. So then what I do is I figure out what number I need to add to both sides in order to complete the square. And that process is take half of your B, so 12 over 2, and then square it. So it's 12 over 2 squared. And that's what I'm adding to the left-hand side, so that's what I'm going to add to the right-hand side. If that makes sense. Well, 12 over 2 squared is 36. Okay. So on the left-hand side, I've got this little thing here, this trinomial that I'm hopefully going to be able to factor very easily. On the right-hand side, normally these will come out to be nice numbers, okay? If I have done my job right, which sometimes I make mistakes, but if I've done it correctly, hopefully that's a nice pretty number. So 64 plus 36 is 100, okay? Check me always, always check my arithmetic. All right, so now inside of here, this should factor out to what? Uh -huh. And x plus six, right? X plus six and x plus six. The idea of the square part is that whenever we finish this, we're gonna have this x plus six squared because it's x plus six times itself. And it's always, always, always a binomial squared over there. Okay, if we've done it right, if we factored it right and all of that. And on the right hand side, I'll normally try to pick pretty numbers that will also be a square. Okay, so now let's finish that out. Um, how do I solve for x? 
Okay, but square rid of both sides. And for our charisma, we're probably going to ignore the negatives, right? Because we're only doing, we're doing a physical, we'll get to that in a second with the geometry. But uh, x plus 6 equals plus or minus square root of 100, but we're just going to say 10. We're going to ignore the negatives for now. We know there's actually two answers, but he didn't use a negative answer. And then what? Not yet. We need to get x completely by itself, so subtract 6, right? So x equals 4. That's your answer. There you go. Algebraically. Now we're going to do it geometrically. Oh, we're... Hmm? Mm hmm Yeah, both direct, both ways. So the geometrically part is the part that actually bugs people more because usually you've seen the algebra, maybe in a college algebra or intermediate algebra or something like that. But uh, whenever we're doing this geometrically, we have to duplicate the process. So the process was take your B term, which was 12 X's, and split it in half, right? So if I've got 12 X's and I'm going to split them in half, what that means is I'm going to have six X's, which hopefully we know a one by X. This is one unit wide and it's X units long, right? Those are the rods if you've used the um, algebra blocks, right? Or longs or whatever you call them. Okay, six of those. And then six coming this way. And hopefully they're about the same width, which mine are not. Mine are terrible. But that's okay. So that's the part where we take the B and we split it. Okay. And then we have to figure out what number to add in. And that is this portion right here. What am I going to add to it to make it a square? And how does that look geometrically? Mm -hmm. Six by six. Absolutely. So extend, 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 extend. There's six going this way, six going that way. So how many little unit guys are there in there? 36. So that's how we know what we put in there. Now, if you were solving this geometrically, you would have this on the left hand side and then you'd have 64 little cubes on the right hand side, which is not terrible. It equals, that's an eight by eight, right? So I can make it not too bad. Two, three, four, one, yeah. Mm-hmm, yeah. We'll just say this is the 64 that we started with. Yeah, because it says do it both ways, algebraically and geometrically, so I'm doing it Mm -hmm. Well, we're not done yet. We, we haven't solved it. Now, the completing the square part is like it would be what number do you add to complete your square? Well, the number is 36. So that would be that part. But if we have to solve it for x, then we need to do the same thing we would have done before. So I'm just showing you this. You're not going to have to do it all the way through for the test, but I'm just making sure everybody understands what's going on. For the geometric part, yes. In fact, for the geometric part, you will just draw this picture, basically. And you would be done. Mm -hmm. It's technically like six and a half. Mm -hmm. So, Matt, algebraically, that's not so bad, right? Because it's 13 over 2 and 13 over 2 if I have an odd number. So, algebraically, I can do that. It's not terrible. Six and a half squared, whatever that is. But geometrically, it's a nightmare for trying to split up because you can't split 13 evenly in half. So, that's why I don't do it, like geometrically. Algebraically, you can 100% do it. It won't be on the test. No, it won't be on the test for geometric. Nope. 
Okay. So to finish that out, you would have to figure out how to add 36 to this guy. But we happen to know this is an eight squared and it needs to be a hundred, right? So we can just square this guy out basically, make him into a hundred. And so that would be what your hundred would look like geometrically. And then you'd go ahead and solve. So it would be X plus six equals 10, which is the same thing we have here. But geometrically it looks weird, so we don't do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Geometrically, yeah. If I ask you to do it algebraically, you can solve it all the way to X. Mm -hmm. So there's two different ways to do it, so be careful with that. All right. What else you got? Okay, number four. Diophantine equations to solve simple systems of equation type problems with products. Oh, thanks, Easter. <laughs> Had to have Easter. Um, such as, find three numbers such that the product of any two added to the third gives a square. Hint, let the numbers be X, X plus six and nine. Okay, X, X plus six and nine. So they're kind of helping me out here. So that one condition is automatically satisfied, which is that the um, third number is a square, right? Nine gives a square. Okay, so what they're saying that if we do X times X plus six plus nine, then what we'll get here is X squared plus six X plus nine. Okay. And what they're saying is it's a perfect square trinomial and that when I add, what was it? Hang on a second. The product of any two added to the third number, that's this, is a square. Okay. So we may have to kind of, um, I don't want to say cheat a little bit, but we may have to take an educated guess here and say what one of the, what the sum is going to be. And a lot of times people just take a number, like they'll say, okay, let the sum be 16 or let the sum be 25 or something like that. And that's actually one of the parts of Diophantine equations that people don't like is because it's not really definitive. Like a lot of times Diophantus would take a guess basically. And he'd say, okay, well, if I let this be this then it forces that to happen. So what's going on here with this guy? If it's equal to some square number, we'll pick a number in a minute maybe. What's going on with this? Excuse me. How can I solve it? I can factor it. Okay. X plus what? Mm -hmm. X plus three and X plus three equals some square number. That's X plus three squared. And again, it equals some number. And if you pick that, here's the part that Diophantus would do that drives people nuts. If you pick that number over there to be a square number, then whenever I go to solve this, it's easy enough, right? So pick a square number. When you square root both sides, you're gonna get a nice pretty number. If you pick that number on the right-hand side to be 15, then it's gonna be ugly, right? So don't pick 15 on a square number. So what would we like? 16. Draw 16 and see. Yeah. Take the square root of both sides. X plus 3 squared equals 4. I'm sorry, X plus 3 equals 4. 
subtract the three off both sides, we get what? X equals one. Let's see. Let's check it and see. All right. When we come back up here, what we have is one for the first guy times what would X plus six be? Seven plus nine, because the third number was nine. Seven. Hmm. And it works. That's 16, right? If you, that's that's the problem yeah so if you don't choose a really if you don't choose your square number wisely enough then if yeah if your right hand side ends up less than your sum on the left hand side you're going to get a negative well diophantus wouldn't have liked that right so he would have ignored that he would have said oh you can't take three minus four or whatever mm -hmm. yeah but he could have picked 25 and check that one out uh, I've had this question before where somebody picked 64 and I think that one worked out okay. So it's just like how big do you, it's that 81 thing, how big of a square number do we want to go and it'll still work. Mm -hmm. That would be zero, so he probably wouldn't. And he already has nine as one of his three numbers, so he probably wouldn't, because he's multiplying and adding, so he probably wouldn't have picked nine. So. Hmm? No, we have the numbers. One, X is one. I'm sorry. We didn't finish it out. Um, X plus six is seven. And the third number was nine. That's what we were given, right? So here are my three numbers. One, seven, and nine. I just didn't write it down. Sorry. Yeah, because it said just pick it that way so that you've got one of the things already there, basically. You just know nine's in there. Yeah, that's what bugs people about Diophantus is that whole picking it because it's just kind of an educated guess and you don't always guess right. <laughs> like Maria said, if I guess four, I'd be in trouble, so. Make it a little bit bigger, but not so big that it's kind of a pain to do the math. Okay, so that was four. Do we need to go back and pick up three since we're working backwards here? Okay, no worries. <laughs> we should have started from the beginning. I would have just walked through. It would have been fine. All right, so before I do this, let's go back and say, um, number one says, make sure you know all the mathematicians. Okay, since um, Diophantus. Make sure you know their contribution to math, if they had a quote, if they had a book, that kind of stuff. So those things will probably be like multiple choice and matching and things like that. So just make sure you can identify them, let's say. Um, it doesn't hurt, but I would go with the main one, which is Arithmetica, right? We had that one and then what, Sumley Bears, I think. Did he do quadrains? Hmm. Oh, poly yeah, polygonal, polygonal numbers, yeah. 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 Don't worry about the prisms. <laughs> I'd worry about the arithmetica if I was you. There's your there's your hint for either watching the video or being in class. <laughs> Now you know. And then number two says know a basic sequence of events about um, what's going on between going from Africa, Middle Eastern, um, European areas, the Crusades, um, armies of Islam, all that. So kind of know what, that, that's that whole religious conversation that we had, right? So there is a lot going on with that. So make sure you can do that. So we're gonna number three. Diophantine equations to show, um, Simple system of equation type problems with sums such as find three numbers such that any two of them added together will give you the sums 53, 103, and 94. Any two of them. Okay. And if you remember, this is the one where we said 
maybe a diagram might help a little bit. The sums of any two of them, right? If I add, for instance, these two numbers together and I get 53, then that means that the third number is not included in that. And that's kind of the logic that he used for this. If I add these two together and I get 103, then that means this number up here is not in that sum. And if I add these two together and I get 94, then that means this one over here is not in that sum. So he kind of like paired them up lots of ways. And the trick to this one was we need to assign X a value. So what was X? Let X be the sum of all three. All three numbers, right? Because he wants me to just work in one variable most of the time. Most of the time, we're not doing an actual system of equations with X, Y, and Z because that becomes complicated. So my first number could be the sum of all of them minus the 94. If these two add up to be 94 and I subtract that out, then I'll get that third number over there. Does that make sense? X minus 94. So if I subtract these two out from the total sum, I'll get this third number. That's what he's trying to do. So then the second number could be, get rid of those two, if I want this one over here. So think about the total sum of all three of them, but subtract out these two. Well, we don't know what they are individually, but we know they add up to 53. So if I subtract the 53, that gives me that third point or that extra point. So X minus 53. And to get the third one that's on top, if I get rid of these two down here on the bottom, then I'll be left over with that third one, right? So my lovely hand covering technique. So if I take the total sum, which is three or the X, and I subtract off this 103, then I'll have this guy left up there. And so he's kind of doing this partial subtraction thing that's interesting, but weird. <laughs> so now what he says is, so the total sum, which we said was X, is you can add the first number plus the second number plus the third number, right? So we've got this combination of adding and subtracting going on. If the first number was x minus 94, then we're going to add that to the second one, x minus 53, and so on and so forth. And now this is just a nice, pretty equation. Diophantus actually wasn't working with our lovely algebraic notation, right? So his was written out, but we're going to do it algebraically because it's much nicer and easier for me to work with. x equals what? Mm -hmm. Three x's. Minus two five zero. Okay. And so just realize that all three of these are negative. So you're just going to add them together and give them the negative sign, right? Or you can punch them on your calculator. It's fine. Okay. Now what? Okay. If I add 250 to each side, I'm going to have x plus 250 equals 3x. Okay, now I need to get rid of this X, right? 250 equals 2X, and that's fine. It just makes everything positive, which is great. If you didn't do that, you would have had to divide by a negative number. So. Now what? Divide by two, X equals 125. Okay, now be careful on these because these are those sum ones. So this, X is my total sum, right? That's not the three numbers. And they asked me to find three numbers. So it's kind of what I like to say, are we done yet? We're not done yet. So up here, we know that my sum is 125. Okay, But I want these three numbers. So I need to go back and substitute, right? So I need to do 125 minus 94, 125 minus 53, and 125 minus 103. So let's see, 6 and 25, 31. Oh, Lord, I'll let y'all do that one. This is 22. 
72. Trust you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm with you now. Do it in my head. I hate doing arithmetic in my head. All right, so do those three numbers work out? 31, 72, 22. They should add up to be a total of 125, and then you should be able to make sure that the little subtraction things work. If we did the subtraction here right, we should be okay there. Just make sure that 31 plus 72 plus 22 is 125, and we should be golden. All right. Okay. So that's one through five. All right. Okay, what about number six? Fibonacci. What does his sequence look like? The rabbit one. Stinking rabbit. One, one. Just remember the one and the one and then start adding, right? So one plus one is two. One plus two is three. Yep, yeah, exactly. Five, eight, 13, dot, dot, dot. Okay. So don't forget that Fibonacci. Okay. Huh? Um, generally on this one, I give you a table to fill out. So, and remember that the notation for Fibonacci is that subset notation, F sub one, F sub two, F sub three, so on and so forth. So this one's the first term. So it's F1, F2, F3. So uh, if I gave you something like be able to do, and I give you some subscript notation there, don't freak out on it. Okay, but basically if I gave you a table, which is normally what I would do on this question, just so that it's orderly and easier for me to grade basically, then uh, what I would say is one of the columns would be because the question says, Understand Fibonacci, be able to reproduce several terms of the sequence, know why it's so important, um, be able to derive the golden ratio using terms of the Fibonacci sequence, and then to practice use the first 10 of the sequence. So um, what's that ratio thing? What am I talking about there? Clipping pages. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll either have this F sub n over F sub n minus one, or it could be F sub n plus one divided by F sub n, because as long as they're off by one, it doesn't matter. Okay, so F sub n divided by F sub n minus one, and I would give that to you. I just need you to be able to see it, understand what it means, and make the substitutions, basically. And then go ahead and do the math so that you can find the golden ratio. So it's either F sub n over F sub n minus one, or it's F sub n plus one divided by F sub n. Okay, so let's think about that. If we were doing, say two, F sub two divided by F sub, if N is two, then two minus one is one, okay? Then this means what? Okay, take your second term and divide by your first term, all right? Well, that one's kind of boring. That's just a one. But then we do it again. So what if N is three? F sub three divided by what? F sub two, good. Then that guy would be two, the third one is two, everybody agree? Here's my first guy, F sub one. Here's my second guy, F sub two. Here's my third guy, F sub three. So are we okay? So Maria says two over one, okay? And that's gonna be two. So far we got a boring sequence. So, our ratio is one and then two. So 
Remember this one's the one that kind of narrows down. It, it goes back and forth and it sandwiches the golden ratio between these two. So I know the golden ratio is gonna be somewhere between one and two, if I remember that part, okay? The next one would be F sub four divided by what? F sub three. And here's my F sub four guy. So what's that gonna be? Mm -hmm. Everybody agree? Three divided by two. The fourth guy is three. The third guy is two. So three divided by two. I hear that's one and a half. Shape. This we did like a table. You found it. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. That's the exact value of it. One plus square root of five over two, and then um, for golden ratio, and then the approximation. Okay, the approximation is 1.619. Okay. Hmm. No. Well, except to know that we're getting closer and closer and closer to 1.6, basically, is what's about to happen. So, yeah, you're right. They're, they're equivalent. So, Um. I would give you enough on the table to figure out which term you're on, F1, F2, F3, like probably going down this way, F1, F2, F3. And then their table would be like, um, probably say something like Fn divided by F sub n minus one. Um, because it'll say, it'll say on the table, it'll say like n equals one equals two, yeah. I'll give you enough that you'll, be able to figure that out. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> so, yay. So if you understand the basic math, you're okay because the table's going to be there for you. So you, it's not so much reproducing. What you got, Alexis? Sorry. 1.619. This guy right here. Let's do another one. F sub uh, 5 divided by F sub 4. Alexis, what's F, F sub five? It actually is five, yep. And F sub four, three. So when you divide that out, five divided by three, you get what? Exactly, right? So we're one, 1.619, but look, we just went from 1.5 to 1.6, so. Yeah, it, so it's, it does that. It, it kind of flips back and forth and around it is what it, it does. So we started at one, then we went to two, then we went 1.5, then we went 1.6. Narrow it down closer and closer and closer to 1.619. It keeps on just narrowing to it. Um, the more decimal places you go out. So if you take this number, the one plus square root of five divided by two, and you punch that on your calculator, it'll give you like eight decimal places. The more of these you go, the more decimal places you get correct. So the next one that we do probably gets us like two decimal points and then we'll get to three decimal points and so on. Is this okay? Don't stress too much about how you're going to know because I'm, I'll make it clear and I'll be in here and I'll answer questions. And the table, I hope, should be clear. <laughs> I've used it before and people have understood it, so I think we'll be okay. All right, number seven. Be able to apply your knowledge of the golden ratio to an everyday example to determine which is the most pleasing to the eye. Remember, that's the point of the golden ratio. It's supposed to be eye pleasing. So the proportions of things in the golden ratio are supposed to be naturally nice for us. To practice, you can examine things with the following dimensions. So let's think about this. This is uh, 
three times 10, B says it's a six by six and C says it's an eight by 10. Okay, these are dimensions. Think pictures. Now, you guys know about pictures. Which one of these is an actual dimension for pictures? Not normally. Yeah, normally it's the eight by 10, right? So, um, but although they do do square pictures, like for school pictures and stuff like that, like three by three, six by six. But um, normally eight by 10, three by five, those are the ones we would normally put into a picture frame, right? I know people don't use picture frames anymore, do they? It's terrible. <sighs> the things we have lost with technology. <laughs> so, so probably I'm gonna lean toward that just to begin with. The idea here is that we're doing a ratio because we want to see if the ratio for each of these is close to the ratio for the golden ratio, which we know is 1.619, right? Okay, so if I want it to be around 1.619, should I put the three on top or the 10 on top? I want it bigger than one. Ah, if I put the three on top, then it's three over 10, that's less than one, right? So I want the 10 on top, 10 over three. Now, what about that though? Yeah, 3.3 .3 repeating, yada, yada, yada. So it's bigger than one, but it's not really very close to 1.6, is it? No, we don't love that one, okay? We'll, we'll hang on to it, but we don't love it. What about this one, six and six? That's just one. Well, that's closer to the, than A, so we can probably drop A. It's not my answer, right? One is closer than that is, but hopefully this one gives me a better answer. Now, which one goes on top? 10 goes on top, 10 over eight. And whenever I divide that out, what do I get? 1.25, I heard. What, two, two, two over, yeah. I'm like, why am I not doing that? Two over eight, yeah, one more, we're good. Okay, so it's, it's not 1.6, okay? But it's the best approximation, it's the closest to the golden ratio of what we got, right? If we actually had a three by five, I think that one's even better, right? If there was a D option, three by five. That would be five over three, right? And that would be 1.2 over three is six repeating. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm like, that's not the best answer. It's not the best possible ratio, but it's the best of the three that I gave. Right. Yeah. So you're just in a quest to find 1.6. Or as close as you can get. Okay. Eight says, understand the controversy that was at the heart of the cubic controversy. Okay. There will probably be some kind of lovely um, essay or short answer question where you have to tar talk about Tartaglia and Cardano. So just be ready for that. And what was the heart of the cubic controversy? What's the problem? No, this is a uh, cubic. Okay, cubic. Yeah, cubic. So this is Tartaglia and Cardano. Okay, so there's two. Yeah, he has students. They both have students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, nope. one of the guys, Fiore or Ferrari, was Cardano's student. Remember the problem is, but you're right, Cardano did supposedly take some of Tartaglia's stuff, um, but he gave him recognition in the forward of his book. Nope, Cardano is different than Tartaglia. Yeah, that's the heart of the problem. Tartaglia didn't publish, right? 
and since he wouldn't publish, but he still wanted the credit, basically, that's the problem. So he wouldn't publish and Cardano like tried to get him to collaborate and write with him and all kinds of stuff and he never would do it. So Cardano went ahead and published. So it's that publisher perish idea. No, that was new. Yeah, yeah. So keep those two straight if you need to write some notes or whatever. So Tartaglia and Cardano. Um, Tartaglia didn't want to publish. Cardano did. Cardano got him a little tipsy or something, supposedly, and got some of the information out of him, and then he expanded on it, and he could solve all the qubits. So he went ahead and published. Ars Magna. That's uh, Cardano's book. Yes. Yes. I would know who wrote Ars Magna. Number eight. Cardano wrote Ars Magna. The great art, that's right. He does because he's the one who published. Now, he also had more complete works than what Tartaglia did. So we know Tartaglia knew how to solve a couple of the different forms of the cubic earlier, but. Uh, he just wouldn't publish it. And he didn't have the complete solution. Cardano has the complete solution. Um, Fiore, he's the one that um, challenged Tartaglia to the competition. You don't need his name per se. He, there's just a lot of F names in that particular area, right? So um, the important ones there are Tartaglia and Cardano. To do what? Oh no, I won't use his real name. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, it's like Nicolo Fontano is Tartaglia's real name, but nobody knows him by that name. So it's always the scammer. That's what we know him by. Yep. And it won't be like on. It's. I think this is a matching section. It won't be his real name. It'll be Tartaglia. The option. What? Okay. And is like and is like You know what? Whenever you come up with something like that, it sticks in your head, and that's yeah. what's important. <laughs> That is exactly what's important. So good job. <laughs> Tartaglia to a competition. No, no, no. It's a competition, actually. Remember, that's where when they did those competitions, it's like Tartaglia got to give five questions and um, Fiore got to give five questions. So they both submit five questions and they you submit questions you know you can answer, right? So in a competition where all you know is your own method, you each get five, it's a tie. But the night before, supposedly, the competition, Tartaglia figured out how to solve those other five. So like he figured out that method, so then he could do all 10. I don't think so. I think it was kind of a public display thing and you go in and you go, here's my solution, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and so somebody, and when you submitted your five, you had to give the solution, right? So we know you know your five and we know she knows her five. So when you submit them, everybody's got the solutions. And then we just check that you got her five and you got her five. So person with the most wins. <laughs> so, and Tartaglia had all 10, what happened? I know, kind of cool. Okay, so first off, there's two parts to this question. One is know the background, know that publisher parish portion, that that's the important part of the controversy. Tartaglia didn't want to publish. Cardano did. So Cardano gets credit because he published. 
The second part is solving the cubic. Okay, and we need to do it like Cardano did. And here's the equation, x cubed plus six x equals 20. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I have this in my notes, so y'all might have to dig it out. Somewhere there is a formula for this and I will give it to you. So what is it? P's and Q's, right? <laughs> Uh oh. <laughs> so you won't have to memorize this. That's the good part, right? This will be something that's given to you. X equals the cubed root of its Q over 2 plus the square root of Q squared over 4 plus P cubed over 27. Make sure I get that right. Uh -huh. Minus the cube root of <laughs> negative Q over two plus all that stuff. So we've got two minuses, but the rest of it's the same. Square root Q squared over four plus P cubed over 27. So this is the formula that Cardano came up with whenever something is a cubic in this format. So you've got the, um, what would that be, CX. You've got the AX cubed and the CX, but you don't have the BX squared, right? So this is his solution. And we know that um, the way this works is it's X cubed plus PX equals Q. So you have to know this is that form. Okay, so you won't have to memorize that formula. You just have to know how to utilize it. Um, in this case, what's my P? P equals six and Q is 20. Does everybody agree? All right. So then it's just a matter of plugging all that stuff in. So you have to be careful. You can't make a bunch of careless mistakes, but you can do it. Um, they're both cube roots, the big guys. Inside, the, the root inside of the big one is, those are both square, square roots. There are a lot of ways that you can make little mistakes here. Absolutely, you'll get a point for writing it down for, for substituting in your P's and your Q's properly. I wonder if this is where that phrase comes from. What's your P's and Q's? Oh, I don't know. I doubt it. But <laughs> what does that mean? P's and Q's? I don't know. Off topic weird question. Uh, I think so. We have to watch our P's and Q's here, right? Have you not heard that saying? Oh, if it goes back to here. <laughs> I thought you'd call me old. <laughs> What's six cubed? 216, I was thinking it was, but then I was like, no, it's 256, isn't it? Okay.
<laughs> Sometimes I do well at the picking. <laughs> Sometimes I pick deliberately nice numbers just so that it'll not be too terribly crazy. All right, so I'm getting x is the cube root of 10 plus, and then inside of here I've got square root of 108. Everybody okay with that? This is 100. And then when I divide this out, the three, the three, the three go away with the three, the three, the three, and the six. And I should be left with a two, a two, and a two. So it's just an eight. But you can double check. So you can divide 216, divide by 27, you should get eight. So that's what Maria said. She has the square root of 108 on the inside. Are we okay? Minus the cubed root of negative 10. It's supposed to be um, like a finance class just sitting in over here. So they're constructing that. I guess we couldn't possibly wait until summer or the month of May when nobody's going to be here the whole month of May. <laughs> Somebody commissioned them to be there. So. so I've got negative 10 plus the square root of 108, right? Is everybody there? All right, now what? How'd you get to your answer, Maria? Okay. So this is approximately 2.73 here, right? And then she plugged in over here and she got negative 0 0.73, right? Okay. And when you subtract those out, x equals 2. Okay. If you go ahead and punch all that in your calculator at once, again, it's a really easy way to make a mistake, right? So try to do one of the roots and then the other root. Two roots, see how that goes. It actually is true. Yeah. So, and so you can go back and check. So make sure that you can go back and check. Um, way up here, x cubed, so 2 cubed is 8, right? Plus 6 times 2 is 12, and that equals 20. Yeah. So we can actually check our answer. It really is easier to check on these. Not problem. What's wrong? Okay. That's a smiley face. Yay. You were kind of at first went and I was like, oh, oh, you forgot your glasses, man. All right. So it is tedious. I'm not saying it's not, but it is doable too. Okay. Especially if I pick a whole nice number for you. Okay. If I pick bad numbers, then it's really ugly, right? Because if we're dividing by 27, we need something on the top that's going to reduce by three, three, and three, basically, right? Because it's 27, three cubed. And uh, this is just a teacher moment for you that you're going to be teachers. Um, if I want something to divide by four, then I need to pick a number that's going to, I pick 20 because 20 squared is 400 and it'll divide. But uh, yeah, pick your numbers wisely. I'm not going to pick nine and divide it by four, right? That's not wise. Picking these out, making these out. Okay. <laughs> if it wasn't, if I made a mistake, then I'll just follow it. It's fine. But my numbers are almost always, I take the extra time to make sure these are not ugly numbers because. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's not going to be nice. All right, number eight done. Woo. Number nine, understand the three X plus one problem as described in class. Be able to do it, find a path. 
You all remember the three X plus one problem? <laughs> yes, I will give you the piece. No, you must memorize that function. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, so the three X plus one problem is centered around the fact that they say you have a piecewise function. It's going to be X divided by two when X is even. And it's going to be 3x plus 1 when x is odd. OK. So I will give you that piecewise function. You're not going to have to memorize it. But it should make sense because they're dividing by 2 on the even guys to make them reduce. And then on the odd guys, they're making them bigger, right? So remember, you've got that kind of ebb and flow that goes up and down. And it says, um, to practice, find the path for x equals 13. OK, so remember, there's a couple of ways to do this. The first iteration is put in the original x. OK, so C1. And remember that this kind of looks like derivative notation, but it's going to be instead of first derivative, second derivative, it's going to be first iteration, second iteration. And it's just that there's only so much notation we can have. So sometimes I get double meaning. Sorry, guys. I didn't do it. <laughs> so the first iteration, I put in a 13. Does it go in the even or the odd? Odd. So 13 times 3 is 39. Plus 1 is 40. Okay. Here's the part you got to watch out for. We don't change the left-hand side, the number that's in there, in the notation for it. So it's the second iteration of 13. But what that means is for the second iteration, I'm not going to put 13 back in again. I'm going to use the 40. So I use the outcome from the first iteration and I put that into the piecewise. So 40 is even, so this guy is 20. Am I all right? Uh oh, that's okay. And we said, is it even or odd? And yeah, pick a line basically. Is it even or odd? Well, 13 is odd, so we use this guy. And it was 13 times 3 plus 1 gives me 40. So that's where that answer came from. Because 13 is odd, that's the only reason. Yeah. So it's literally you're looking at your input and you're saying, is that guy even or is that guy odd? And that determines which line you use. So for the second iteration, Alexa, I used 40. And 40 is even or odd? Even. So I put it into the first line. So the 40 went in up here. So 40 divided by 2, well, that just gives me back a 20. That's where that came from. All right, Caroline, what's my next iteration? C3. Why? OK, because 20, the output from the second iteration was even. So we put it into the first line. So 20 divided by 2 is 10. We agree? OK. So then C4, the fourth iteration, we put in the 10. 10 is even or odd? Even. So we put it in the first line. 10 divided by 2 is 5. OK. And remember that when we start seeing a 5 pop out, we know, oh, we're kind of on the right track because nice things are going to happen for us, which is lovely. OK. Um, we're about to be in, in the powers of two <laughs> realm, which is nice for us. So the fifth iteration, what happens when it's odd? OK, so that one I'm going to pull over here. 3 times 5, 15, right? Plus 1, 16. But that's nice because. 16 is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. Okay. And so this is where it gets nice for us. 
as soon as I see a five or something that's a power of two, I'm like, yes. C of five or C of six of 13 is. Okay, 16 is even, so divide by two, so I get eight. C seven of 13 is four. Come up here. C eight of 13 is two. And C nine of 13 is one. And remember, that's the whole entire point of the three X plus one problem is, it doesn't matter what number you put in, what integer you put, put in there, you're gonna eventually come down to one. Okay, we don't do rational numbers fractions. Mm -hmm. It's because they don't have a proof. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, and there's never been a counterexample. Okay, so if somebody came up with a counterexample, then they wouldn't need a proof. But because there's no counterexamples, it always works if you follow it long enough. And we don't have a proof, it's unsolved. We don't know why. We just don't know why. Now, we do know some stuff about the patterns, right? Like the powers of two and stuff like that. But uh, there's no proof yet. It is positive numbers. I was actually just thinking that because I used the word integers and then I thought, hmm, would that work with integers? Um, and I'm thinking about it. It would probably go to negative one. Think about that. It was negative, say it was negative 13 and this would be negative 40, negative 20 negative 10, negative five, then I'd multiply, oh yeah, we're gonna have a problem because when I multiply negative five by three, I get negative 15, but I add one, I'm gonna get negative 14. So that negative is probably gonna throw the pattern off. I don't know that it won't work because then I can work with 14 and eventually it would probably come down. But, uh, so I probably should not say integers. I should probably say natural numbers or whole numbers, that kind of thing. Am I out of time? I'm sorry. 10, um, understand the controversy that was at the heart of the calculus controversy. What is it? Newton didn't want to publish. Um, now he's the one who did the anagrams though, right? Okay, so he had proof that he had written it previously. So everybody knew it really was his. Um, were you able to describe the differences between their calculus? What was the difference? Notation. Leibniz had a lovely notation. Newton's looked like Egyptian numbers. Crap. Okay, so we didn't want that. We want Leibniz's numbers. So know that. And then, yep, yeah, that's it. Woo, we did really well. Um, recall all the material covered since the first test is fair game. We did really great. By the way, on this one, let me go back to number nine. Caroline hurried me just a little bit. Um, if you do the path, the path is this whole thing, right? All the way to the ninth iteration. If I ask you how many iterations it takes, then your answer is nine, okay? So be careful about reading the direction on that one. Do you want the path or do you want to know how many iterations? Okay, is everybody all right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we use Leibniz notation. Um, you don't have to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is what it is. It's the dy dx part that was Newton or Leibniz's, whereas Newton used x with a dot on top of it, which we we don't like that. Okay.
So we're done. Class time's over. If you need to go, feel free. But if you have questions, stick around. What about the sequence of events? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, so basically that's about the difference between um, the armies of Islam and what's going on with that. So think about Muhammad. Mm -hmm. So what? Oh, caliphs are the governors, basically. Okay, so they're the ones who are running the government, the, the government, quote unquote, of the armies of Islam. Um, they're the ones who are, it actually ends up that the, the yeah, it splits into two um, portions. There's like an Eastern and a Western and of Islam. Yeah, they did too. They were so big, they have to have two. But it's the guy over here that's in um, Constantinople that turns into Istanbul. He's the one who turns kind of moderate, not as extremist. And uh, so instead of burning the textbook, he's like setting up the house of wisdom. And that was Khalif al Mansur. No, he's a Khalif. He's, is, yeah. He is uh, armies of Islam all the way. Yeah. But he's um, more moderate. So. Um, Constantine is the one who um, established Christianity. Khalif Mansur. Al Mansur. Mm -hmm. no. Oh, he was, yeah. So that guy, Khalif Al Mansur. He's the one who established um, the House of Wisdom, which actually turns into like a world-class kind of university. So, Rahi, he's the one who died really, really young of a kidney element or a bladder element. He's the one that had the 20 years worth of data that he gathered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He died at 30, 29, 30. Hmm? With the what? Hmm. He's the one that didn't do math. Yeah. So Tycho Brahe, he was observing the skies for Mm hmm 20 years and he had 20 years worth of data but no math and what ends up happening is he pairs up with Kepler who's a math guy mm -hmm. and so um, when Brahe dies he leaves all his 20 years worth of data to Kepler because he was his assistant and um, Kepler uses that data to prove that um, the sun is the center. He's not in there? Oh, he's got to be in there. Uh huh. Johann Kepler. He's right before Brian. Uh huh. Yeah. And a lot of times I'll write their first names in the notes, but I never called them by that. It's like, you know, when y'all go, oh, Newton class or Webster class. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> I don't know. I've heard y'all talk about Newton class or Webster class. <laughs> That's right, right. So <laughs> it's the same kind of thing. Like, uh, I mean, I knew it was Johann Kepler, but we just don't call him. I don't know why. It's like Newton. We just call him Newton. Um, it's Sir Isaac Newton, but I don't care. Ooh, ooh, I like that. Summer, are you hanging around to ask a question? No, I was just hearing the last minute comments from other students asking questions. Awesome. You don't need anything. I'm going to stop this recording.
No, I'm good. If you have anything, let me know.